Welcome everyone. Um, this is our August Bird Friendly Communities Lunch and Learn. Um, we're really happy to have you joining us today. Um, this webinar is part of a series of Lunch and Learns um, that are all focused on the Michigan Bird Friendly Communities Program. So each month we discuss a different topic that's related to the um, Bird Friendly Communities Program um, as a whole that we're working on here in Michigan. Uh, so today we're gonna to be talking about chimney swifts, but before we get to that, I just wanna cover a couple of logistics with everyone. There are two ways you might be joining us today, either through Zoom or through Facebook. Um, and we encourage you to send us your questions throughout the presentation. Um, you can do that on Zoom through the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and on Facebook, you can just leave your questions in the comment section. Um, I'll monitor those throughout the entire presentation, but we'll answer those at the end and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, but I do encourage you to go ahead and send those to us when you have them so that you don't forget them by the end of the presentation. Of course, new questions happen and that's great too, but we wanna make sure that we get everybody's questions answered. Um, this presentation is being recorded. Um, it will be available immediately after we're finished on our Facebook page to review. Um, and it will also be available on the Michigan Audubon YouTube channel sometime within the next week. So you can view this webinar and the others that are part of this series through the Michigan Audubon YouTube channel at any time. So if you're watching a recording of this, or if you have questions at a later time, please feel free to submit your questions to us um, at the Michigan Audubon general email address at birds at michiganaudubon.org. So um, thank you again for being with us today. Uh, we're really lucky to be joined by Juliet Berger. Juliet is the ornithologist for the city of Ann Arbor, um, and she serves as the president of Washington, Washington Audubon. Um, so she's got some really great information and experiences to share with us today. So thank you, thank you to Juliet for joining us. And with that, I'll hand things over to you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It's really a pleasure to um, get a chance to chat with folks about Chimney Swifts. We spend a lot of our emotional energy um, in Washtenaw worrying about and trying to protect Chimney Swifts and organizing events for uh, counting them and just kind of trying to keep track of them. So this is a nice opportunity for um, me to chat about them and about what we're doing here in Washtenaw. Um, so I will start to share my screen, I believe. Um, Lindsay, before I do, can you see where everyone is tuning in from? I cannot because we did no. not ask for that information, but people can go ahead and add that information on Zoom through the chat function um, or through the comment section on Facebook and we can kind of try to figure that out. Because that might be fun for me to know where people are, sure. are watching from. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully this works. There it is. And if I can get to presentation mode, that would be great. But my Toolbar just went in front of my other bar. Let's see if I can get this out. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a little tough here from the beginning. Okay, here we go. We apologize in advance for any technical difficulties. This is supposed to be the beginning of my presentation. It's taking a minute to load. And Lindsay and I did not have any issues with this when we did our little run through, so. It's um, funny when you troubleshoot things and they, or you prepare to troubleshoot things and it does not work, so. Oh, I, it did, it's, okay. I am at the end, so I wanna go back to the beginning. So. Um, well, you can do this fast. <laughs> Hey, now you've seen the whole thing. So I don't know why it said from the beginning and it started me at the end, but here we are. Um, so this is about our love affair with Chimney Swifts. Um, I'm Juliet Berger. I'm the president of Washington Audubon. I've been the president here since 2014. Um, and I'm also the ornithologist for the city of Ann Arbor Natural Area Preservation, which is a division of the parks 
and rec here in Ann Arbor. Um, we love chimney swifts and we spend a lot of energy looking after them. Um, so today I'm gonna cover the natural history of chimney swifts, um, some of their migration patterns and distributions within North America, um, their conservation status, and I'm probably going to spend most of my time talking about um, what Washington Audubon has been doing for the last few years. This is actually our sixth year that we're running a Swift Nights Out event where we recruit volunteers from all over the county to help us monitor the known roosts that we have. And so what we do to protect the roosts and save the Swifts and raise awareness about Swifts is, is a really um, important part of the work that we do here at Washington Audubon. Um, you'll see from the photo of the two Swifts on this slide that um, they're clinging to a vertical surface. And these little guys cannot uh, perch like a songbird. They're not songbirds. They're actually more closely related to hummingbirds. However, they are adapted for vertical surfaces. And so um, they spend their whole day flying. And if they have to per if they have to roost at some point, they will cling to a vertical surface or go inside a chimney. Uh, a surface of a building or something like that because their claws and their structure of their body doesn't allow them to perch. Um, some people have told me they've seen chimney swifts on the ground, perhaps they've fallen and they can't really even stand on a horizontal surface. They really need a vertical surface to cling to and to take off into flight from. Um, here's some facts that we um, know about chimney swifts. Um, we know they're in trouble. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, their numbers have been declining for um, quite a long time, 72% in the last 50 years. Um, there has been a distinct decline in chimney swifts um, since the era of DDT and they haven't really rebounded after DDT was banned in the US. And uh, there's quite a bit of research being done about why that may be the case. And actually um, we have read some articles from a researcher who, who researches Chimney Swiss and he's based out of Kingston, Ontario. Um, and his research into Chimney Swift guano, that's the poo that accumulates at the base of the chimney, um, has told them that chimney swifts diet has changed a lot since the DDT era, that perhaps the insect um, availability and the insect type has changed since DDT wiped out certain varieties of insects. So um, it looks like from doing core samples of the guano that chimney swifts ate many more flying beetles in the area era before DDT. And so perhaps some of their nesting success or lack thereof and their numbers declining has to do with their diet changing and they haven't had enough time to adapt. Also, we know that climate change causes disturbances in migration, big storms, heat, uh, winds, that type of thing. The rate of population decline for chimney swifts sadly is 2.5% decline annually in North America. Um, obviously, we know they didn't always nest in chimneys. Back before um, European settlement, they roosted and nested probably in large hollow trees. Um, starting in 1850s, at least in Michigan, we know that most of the trees were logged in the state. So those type of roosting and nesting areas were lost. Um, and so they quickly, uh, adapted to using our um, brick and masonry chimneys, and they really can't nest and roost anywhere else. Um, so in our cities and towns, these old masonry chimneys are being torn down for new development or capped because that's what uh, chimney experts recommend for people to keep critters out. And so they're losing some of their nesting and roosting habitat. I'm making a distinction between roosting and nesting. So 
These birds roost together communally in spring when they arrive from their migration from South America and in the fall when they're staging for their fall migration. And here in mid-August, that's chimney swift fall, most of them have finished nesting and the unmated swifts and the nestlings and the parents are um, trying to roost together and that's something they do that helps them stay warm at night during uh, the fall. Um, and I don't know what the ultimate reason is, but they seem to like to be together. Um, and you can almost experience their joy when you see them. Um, let's see. So we already chatted about how they can only perch on a vertical surface. They have especially um, stiffened tail feathers that help to prop them up on that vertical surface. If you ever see a chimney swift up close, it's pretty remarkable. And here in Washtenaw County, we have the Bird Center of Michigan that does rehab. It's one of the specialized places in, in our region that does rehab on um, injured swifts and baby swifts that might have fallen out of a nest. And so they have specialized equipment. And if you are able to volunteer there or help there, you would be able to see them up close. Um, they are classified as near threatened in the US and they are an endangered species in Canada. Um, here, I'm just gonna kind of go through our chimney swift fact sheet. Um, they eat about a third of their body weight in insects per day. They don't have any known transmissible diseases and they roost communally, but they tend to nest as one pair per chimney roost, uh, per chimney. And sometimes they'll let the unmated friends of theirs roost with them, but generally it's just one pair nesting in each chimney, no matter how large. Um, they arrive here in April uh, into the Michigan area. They only generally have one brood, so later nesting chimney swifts that you might see may have had a nest failure um, this year. Uh, as you know, they're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So if you happen to have chimney swifts in your own home chimney, you must let them complete their nesting cycle and move on before you cap your chimney. Obviously, us, since we're bird lovers, we wouldn't want to hurt any. But if your neighbors tell you about it, you might want to remind them that it is a federal offense to um, attempt to remove the nesting chimney swifts until they have completed their nest. Um, and many of us have seen the spectacle of chimney swifts entering chimneys um, in the fall and in the spring when they first arrive, but they it's such an amazing sight. I recommend that everybody go to a chimney swift roost in your area. There's always one um, nearby and um, if you're in our region, we can help you figure out where to go. And I'm sure Lindsay could have some uh, chimney swift roost to recommend as the summer and fall comes on. Um, this large chimney that Washington Audubon has um, worked very hard to protect, it's on a derelict building um, right in the downtown area, but it's a freestanding chimney. So we've had up to 1400 in that chimney and you'll see this chimney in some of the slides that I'm going to um, show. Um, also our um, Washtenaw Audubon conservation chair, Kathy Tyson can't be with us today, but she's worked super hard um, with various um, business owners, building owners and city entities to um, get them to understand the importance of preserving and remain uh, keeping their chimneys uncapped. Here's their migration map. So Lindsay, do you see my black toolbar up there? And is there a way you don't see it? Okay, good. As long as it's not bothering you. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, so here's this, it's far down. They go down into Chile in South America during the winter time. And I've seen some recent research that maybe they don't even roost down there. They just fly around and eat bugs all the time. 
Um, but we've always thought that they roosted in old hollow trees in the Amazon and in other places where there's still old growth forest in South America. They migrate through Central America and Mexico, and they're up into the southern areas of Canada um, and through our region in Michigan. They um, nest between May and August here in our region, and probably a little bit earlier if you're looking for chimney swifts in Florida and the southern regions of the US. Um, I'm gonna give a shout out to Jocelyn Anderson, who is a local photographer who helped me out with a bunch of our photos. These are her, this is one of her photos from a recent field trip that we were on together. And she's an award-winning photographer and has won some Michigan Audubon photography awards as well as nationally. So thank you, Jocelyn. Um, so that's kind of the basic information about chimney swifts. Uh, their flight patterns are super interesting. So you might notice if you're looking at chimney swifts that their wing beats are very stiff. Um, unlike our swallows, which are another species of aerial insectivore, they look like a little cigar with wings. Uh, they don't really flap as much as teeter, it looks like. Um, I don't even have a idea of how many folks that are on the call are familiar with chimney swifts, but. So this is what we've been up to in Washtenaw in terms of protecting and raising awareness about chimney swifts. Um, we've had a lot of press coverage thanks to our conservation chair, Kathy Tyson. She is really great about interfacing with MLive and Ann Arbor News. Um, we have a new program within the last year for Chimney Swift Guardians. So all of our little communities within Washtenaw, like Chelsea, um, Celine, Manchester, um, Dexter, Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor, we're trying to uh, recruit, and we've done pretty well in recruiting chimney swift guardians to keep an eye on their roosts, where the swifts are roosting, make sure we know if there's any construction or plans to tear the swifts roosts down. And also um, we have a bunch of signage that we've recently printed out and we like to raise awareness within these communities. Um, again, most chimney swifts are nesting and roosting in towns rather than in rural areas. So you go to a rural area like Manchester, but the birds are gonna be mostly found within the city because that's where their roosts and nests are. Um, so we have a bunch of signage that we want to go up on the buildings that are um, hosting chimney swifts so that people understand what's going on. I don't know if any of you have been out to a swift roost at night, but people are always saying to me, what are all those bats doing out there? Um, and so it can be confusing for people who are not aware of what chimney swifts are, that they're birds and not bats, um, and that they're going inside the chimney at night rather than coming out as a bat would. Um, so this, was, this is one of our swift roosts here that's on um, North Main Street in Ann Arbor. And this, uh, this building looks kind of derelict, but inside is full of beautiful lofts with uh, retail spaces. And um, the owner of this building is absolutely thrilled that he has chimney swifts. So there's a sign up there. Um, we have had recently this sign went up in collaboration with the Tree Line Conservancy. The Tree Line Trail is an urban trail through Ann Arbor that goes sort of follows the Allen Creek drainage. Most of Allen Creek is underground. Um, now was was put into pipes, but um, there are areas when it where it peaks back out and we have the tree line trail going through the city and connecting with Ann Arbor's border to border trail. Um, so this sign went up next to the chimney at 415 West Washington, which is the one that we lobbied the city to preserve that's connected to a derelict um, road commission building this chimney. Um, is freestanding. So even though the building is slated to be demolished, the chimney is 
um, our agreements with the city are that the chimney will be preserved. So we have signage like this, uh, shows their migration patterns, shows what they look like, shows a good example of a chimney swift in a nest. Um, here's a chimney with swifts coming out. And uh, this is a pretty prominent sign in a prominent place in the downtown area. So we're very excited that this has recently gone up. Um, this is the sign that Washington Audubon printed with the help of Michigan Audubon. And I think Lindsay was helpful to us in a big help in designing uh, and the layout of this sign. So thank you, Lindsay, and thanks to Michigan Audubon for their help. This is um, going up at all the swift roosts that we know about throughout the county. We're about to do a second printing. Um, we've got probably a dozen to 18 roosts that we're looking at and monitoring throughout the county. So we'll have lots of signs to put up. And thanks again to Kathy Tyson for her work on this. And so this weekend, um, we have our Swift's Night Out event. This is another thing that we do to um, raise awareness and uh, bring the bring local people and to get them involved in learning about and watching Chimney Swifts. Um, it takes place throughout the county and I, I've been organizing for the past six years and it's a joint project between Washington Audubon Society and where I work at Natural Area Preservation. Um, there's a sign up uh, that you can also find on the Washington Audubon website. Here's the link to the sign up if you want to copy that. Um, we have lots and lots of roots to choose from and uh, it's an event that takes place over the span of three days. So Friday, Saturday and Sunday this weekend, we'll be counting swifts and we'd love for folks in the adjacent areas to Washtenaw to come in and help. We have lots of spots still available, um, but also I was hoping by presenting this information that some other Audubon societies might be interested in running a similar event in their regions. Um, so, excuse me. Um, it's a really fun night and it was a great time for social distancing and still since we're going back to some of that now during uh, some of the Delta variant, um, it's a great time to be outside with your family. You can invite your friends and you can wear masks if you want a whole bunch of friends with you. Um, and just watching these birds go into the chimneys is such an amazing sight. Uh, Lindsay and I were laughing about it before the presentation started, but it's, uh, it's really an amazing phenomenon, one of the wonders of the natural world. So if you're interested in Swift Nights Out, you can contact me uh, or look on the WashingtonAudubon.org website. Um, I put this slide up just because these are some, uh, some examples of media that we've had about our local chimney swifts, about trying to preserve various chimneys, um, about the chimney swift initiative that we have here at Washtenaw. Um, there's a web page at the city of, uh, city of Ann Arbor Parks Department. Um, and, and there's the link to the sign up genius for Swift Nights Out. This is another one of Jocelyn's lovely photos. So I'm gonna show you a couple examples of chimney swifts going into a chimney at dusk. Um, this one was taken by our treasurer at Washington Audubon, Keith Dickey, and he's counting the swifts as they go in and they can go in really fast.
So you get the idea, but something I wanted to mention, as they're swirling around, they're not entering the chimney in that tornado action, but they, when they decide to enter, they drop kind of like a leaf straight in. So you'll see their flight pattern change when you're trying to count them as they're dropping um, their, their flight style changes. So you can see some of them are continuing to swirl and some of them are dropping in. Here's another video. And we had some trouble with it before, so let's hope that will load. Um, this is at the same chimney, but a time of day when it was a bit lighter and easier to see. 415 West Washington, the chimney swift roost that we've preserved despite the building being derelict. So you can see the vacuum action as some of them are just appearing to be sucked into the chimney despite the fact that they're dropping in of their own volition. This gives you some perspective and how a chimney swift might see and choose a chimney to use as a roost, um, simulating the old growth trees that they previously would have nested and roosted in. So when we're counting chimney swifts, we look and count until the last swift goes in. I always recommend people use binoculars because as it gets really dark, it's very difficult to see the last few entering the chimney. You could all hear the chittering sound they make. Chimney swifts have a bit of sonar. That sonar they use to catch the bugs that they eat, the flying insects. So um, we have a new environmental education center with the Ann Arbor Public Schools uh, up on the Northeast side of town called the Freeman Environmental Education Center. And they can actually look up into the chimney there. And there was a nesting uh, chimney swift. So you can see the photo of the nest. It's not great quality, but um, first one I've ever seen in person. Um, we have a lot of partners that help with our chimney swift initiative, especially Michigan Audubon who has helped us with our signage and just emotional support during all of our Chimney Swift endeavors. And um, uh, also, and the City of Ann Arbor Natural Area Preservation, where I work, who partners with us on Swift Nights Out, the Bird Center of Michigan that does all the rehab for Swifts, Ann Arbor Public Schools, uh, which have a lot of buildings that, that host swift roosts like Mac School, which is one of the largest uh, roosts in town and this Freeman Environmental uh, Education Center. The Tree Line Trail has been a great new um, co-sponsor co of various chimney swift things with us. Uh, we partner with local churches and business owners local government entities. There's a chimney swift sign going up on the city hall and city offices in Milan um, shortly. And um, because the swifts tend to nest in these older buildings, we are doing a lot of partnering with districts that have older schools and governments uh, that have older government buildings and old factories where that might still be in use for other purposes. So this is a cool thing about chimney swift nests. They stick these twigs to the vertical surface with saliva, which is super sticky and keeps this little tiny nest stuck to the wall of a chimney. And then while the female is incubating the eggs, she will put some extra sticky stuff all around to try and make sure this thing doesn't fall down when her babies <laughs> come hatch. And so there's often a line of stickiness over the top and all around it that she's just kind of 
when she's bored sitting on the X, she just puts some more sticky stuff out there. Some of you might have heard of bird's nest soup, and that is made from a nest of a relative of our chimney swift, the cave swiftlet, and it is actually cooked up, strained out the twigs and used the saliva as a thickener for the soup. Apparently very yummy, but I haven't tried it. Um, so that's pretty much the end of my presentation. And I have lots of time, I'm hoping for questions. Um, and I'm taking questions now, I guess. <laughs> Perfect, thanks, Juliet. Um, yeah. So if you have questions, um, you can submit those again to us through the Q&A box on Zoom or the comment section on Facebook. Um, and we do have one question, but while you <laughs> gather some other questions, I also wanted to let you all know, I put a link in both the chat and on the Facebook page to the Michigan Audubon Chimney Swift resource page, which has a lot of really great information about Chimney Swifts. And it also has a map of roost sites throughout the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So um, you can look at those there. You can also submit new roost sites. So if you find a roost site this fall, um, feel free to submit that information to our website as well. Um, this is a really great way for local chapters and other local organizations to help protect these really important habitats for our chimney swifts. And so mm -hmm. um, it's really fun to go look for them. You can make an evening of it. Um, go to schools are great, churches, older buildings, of course, um, downtown areas. If you have a downtown is a really great place to look for them. Um, you want to go around dusk because that's when you're going to see them. But it can that's be a really right. fun activity. Um, and it can be a really fun family activity. I, my son is three and a half. And last year he went out and helped me count chimney swifts and had a great time. So it's great for people of all ages and all skill levels. So I do absolutely you to do that. Um, yeah, even so. our, our ability challenged uh, members of Washington Audubon can drive up to Mac School and count Chimney Swiss without having to walk a long distance. Um, it's a great activity for the evening for families and people of all different abilities. Right. Yeah. So um, the one question I do have right now um, from someone is, uh, since they only nest in one, like in one nest per chimney, doesn't that yes. greatly limit their number of successful nests? Um, that's a great question. Um, there are quite a few chimneys on private homes and on small buildings that have little tiny, not a massive chimney where one pair will be able to roost. Now, in order to, or nest, I mean, in order to nest, the chimney has to be unlined so it can't have metal flashing inside and it can't have a cap on top. And so there are some older homes that meet these requirements. And as long as people don't cap their chimneys or, or line them with flashing, then they can be used by the chimney swifts. Um, there, are, there is a limit to that. And as more modern constructions are coming up and older buildings are coming down, there is an issue with them finding enough nest sites, yes. And that may be a limiting factor for their breeding success. The number of factors in addition to the change of insects, the lowering of insect populations, and the destruction of chimneys is just that folks are capping and modifying their chimneys so that they can't be used by swifts anymore. And that's a really sad thing. I looked at my own chimney at my house. I've lived here for 20 years and it has a cap on it. So we'll have to do something about that. Yeah, that's a really important thing that, mm -hmm. um, that people can also share with their friends, relatives. Um, it's, it may seem weird to leave your chimney uncapped. I know the whole point of capping your chimney is to keep out unwanted visitors, but I also have heard from people who do have chimney swifts in their chimneys that it's quite fun because you can hear them, but they don't get through, right? They're, they stay yeah. up there. They're not, they're not a nuisance at all. They just, you can hear them chattering a little bit, which is kind of fun. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely something to look forward to um, if you're interested in uncapping your chimney and giving them a place to be able to live because yes. this is their habitat and their habitat is disappearing rapidly. Absolutely. Any other questions? Oh, there, they're coming in. Oh, good. 
Um, so someone says, I know that organizations build roost towers. Have those been successful? And do we know, are they used? So Julia and I were just talking about this before, <laughs> before we got started today. And yes, Michigan Audubon has erected um, several chimney swift towers over the past few years and a couple other partner organizations and volunteers have done the same. As of now, there are no reported confirmed nestings in artificial chimneys um, in the state of Michigan. They are really successful in the South. Um, mm -hmm. The designs were actually made by someone in Texas. Mm -hmm. So there's been some there's been some debate over whether or not they're warm enough. Maybe if the chimney right. folks that live in Michigan need the chimney to be connected to a building so that it can be warm enough to raise their young. Um, but unfortunately, we've yet to be successful, but I, I still am hopeful. We have a couple of chimney swift towers that we've erected in the past couple of years that are really close to active nesting sites, um, which would be really good candidates. But mm -hmm. um, it can be a lot of work for a little reward because it's really great for educational purposes, but in terms of actually creating a useful space for the, chi the chimney swifts, we have yet to be successful in Michigan. Yes, and there's even um, some organizations on the East Coast, uh, Northeast, that have put up masonry chimneys and about 10% of them have been used by chimney swifts. Um, so, The idea is to preserve the ones that we have rather than trying to build artificial chimneys to replace ones that have been torn down because the chimney swifts are particular. There's a microclimate in there that they like or they don't like. And even known roost change periodically. For example, in Ann Arbor, Burns Park School used to have the largest roost, one of the largest ones in Southeast Michigan. Uh, I've counted nine or 10,000 there in the past. I started volunteering with Detroit Audubon in 2012 to do some swift monitoring in Washtenaw County. And now Burns Park School's chimney is still open. And occasionally we see three or four swifts going in in the fall. So we still have it on our list of active sites, but there's no 10,000 chimney swifts going in there. Uh, Detroit Audubon and the other local Audubon societies, uh, Oakland, used to do field trips to Burns Park, but they don't come there anymore because it's not a thing. Um, this year, kind of interestingly, over at Slauson Middle School here in, on Washington Street in Ann Arbor was one of the largest chimney swift roosts back in the early 2010s when I started monitoring. And I would count 6,000, 8,000 in there. And then the chimney swift stopped using it. Uh, we never knew why. And last year I noticed some swifts gathering up there, um, a couple dozen in the evening, getting ready to use the chimney for roosting. And this year I counted over 500. So they're back at Slauson for anybody who's local and interested in seeing a big chimney swift roost in action. At least as of the end of July, there were uncountable numbers there, at least to me. They were going into the chimney after dark. So if I didn't have my binoculars, I could hear them, but I could not see. It was, but before, before they started descending into the chimney, it was a massive cloud of hundreds and hundreds. So the chimney swifts decide for their own reasons whether they're going to use a roost, whether they're going to forget about that roost for 10 years and then come back. Um, we, the best thing we can do is to preserve as many roosts and nesting chimneys for them as possible. And not to count on them showing up for the party. <laughs> oh, that's the thing that, that is kind of that hard for me to do. Part, right? You don't yeah. want to be discouraged because you might go to a place where you're like, oh, there's always a lot of swifts here. Yes. And there might not be any, you know, it happens. That's right. So mm -hmm. part of the fun of birding though, right? You never really it know. Is, what it is the fun of birding. It's like a treasure hunt. Sometimes mm -hmm. you find the tre treasure and sometimes you don't. But the good thing I find with being able to hear them, so this late in the summer, a lot of birds aren't singing, but chimney swifts are almost always calling. So if you, under, if you know what their little chittering call sounds like, you can find out where they are roosting. 
I, I stood downtown last week at the 415 West Washington site where they are not roosting at this time, and that might change tonight, but I could hear them all around and I saw them going west, and so that's how I discovered that the big roost was at Slauson. Yeah. Are there other questions before we finish for today? Well, while you're thinking of those last minute questions, again, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing later. So if you wanna share it with others, um, you can also view the other Bird Friendly, uh, Bird Friendly Communities Lunch and Learns from earlier this year. Um, you can also find those on the Michigan Audubon YouTube channel or on our Facebook page. Um, there are a lot of really great resources, both surrounding Chimney Swifts and other bird-friendly communities programs on the Michigan Audubon website. So I encourage you to check that out as well um, and share this information with others because it's really important that we educate as many people as we can, um, especially for birds like the Chimney Swift that rely so heavily upon people. Um, so with no further questions, I will thank you all for joining us today and thank Juliet for sharing her um, experience and her wisdom with us. And um, hopefully we will see you all again at future Lunch and Learns um, for the remainder of the year. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It's a pleasure to share my story and our swift journey here in Washington with all of you. Bye, everyone. Bye.